this country, uh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. anyway. I, uh, so I see it's 7.30, so maybe we should get started, Alex. Um, yes. So once again, thank you everybody for joining our weekly CAT conference. Uh, today, it's a real pleasure <coughs> to have a very good friend, uh, Alex Abizé from Sao Paulo. Um, who unfortunately we have to see each other like this, Alex, via video. I was looking to come to Sao Paulo. I was yeah. supposed to come this month to see you and to be at a conference, yeah. but hopefully we'll be able to travel in person soon. Alex, you're a real expert on novel technology, so I'm glad you decided to share with us and for the fellows, really, uh, this talk on next generation tablet technologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azim. This is a, a great pleasure to be among friends, even if it's virtually. I'm also glad to know that Eberhard Grube is joining us because he really was very helpful and, and contributed a lot in the early fields of TAVR. And uh, we share uh, many studies together in the early phase. I think that we are all brave enough to believe in this technology in the early phase when we have, you know, transeptal punctures, fem fem bypass. So the 15 years ago, it's amazing how uh, we developed and how we progressed uh, with uh, such technology. And these are my conflicts. I work as a proctor for BSC and Edwards. And as I, I was mentioning, we really started with uh, two main prototypes, uh, Core Valve and, and uh, Sapien. And in those early days were not so easy and not so simple. We had to overcome some major complications, including vascular access. Those devices were much bulkier. Those are the first generation. And, and again, in the past decade, we saw the development of several other generations of uh, new prosthesis, which really helped us to really treat more complex anatomies and expand the indication of TAVR. So my mission in this next uh, 15 to 20 minutes is to really uh, summarize the main mechanism of action of several new, new and, and, and even the ones that I uh, started 15 years ago with the newer generation is again to understand the mechanism of deployment of these uh, new valves. So since the main uh, target of this audio it's really a young fellow, so I'm not going to bother you too much and make you tired of so many uh, numbers and, and data and results of many studies. I think that you all have access to that in the literature, but uh, my mission will be really to share with you some of these exciting uh, new valves so you understand what is coming the horizon. I think that in the U.S. you don't have many, many options, but very soon, I think we're gonna have two or three more options to treat your patients and to have these valves in your shelves. So you can make your decision when you're gonna use each of these valves. So again, I could not uh, start uh, without mentioning uh, the big contribution of the Satan family by, by Edwards. I think it's a, a balloon expandable valve. This is the close up look of the last generation. So the Satan 3 Ultra. I think that the main uh, difference is really that they extended the outer skirt and changed the tissue that uh, they manufacture to make it a little bit more textured. And if you uh, have another close-up look of our, uh, specifically about this, the, this outer skirt, you can see that they, they clearly extended and now a more textured uh, fabric as opposed to this flat woven fabric that they used before. So this is good news in terms of uh, power valve la leak. It's well known that this balloon expandable valve has the lowest, one of the lowest PVL rates among all the valves. Uh, so by doing that, it's really close to elimination of this uh, complication that you don't wanna see, particularly in younger patients that can suffer ventricular dysfunction along the next decade of their lives. And, and, and uh, this is the, the sheet, the expandable sheet, as I mentioned to you before, we started with 24 French, which was a real limitation in the first generation. Now we moved more aggressively with 14 French sheets. Yes, they are expandable, as you can see here, but it's much less traumatic to the femoral axis that we use in more than 90% in, of our cases. Very short video to uh, show to the fellows 
how this valve works. So we retracted the sheet. And then um, you see the balloon expansion under rapid pacing. Again, you see the, the outer skirt here with the concept of sealing uh, any power valve la leak. Very simple approach. And again, this is uh, also one of the, the lowest uh, pacemaker rates that we see in the market. So this is a, a, a great platform that put the bar very high for competition. Now, moving ahead with uh, Evolute. Uh, now we have Evolute R, which is the latest uh, generation, if you can compare with the first generation core valve. And again, more credit to my friend Eberhard Grube, who really uh, started the, the field of uh, self-expandable valves. I think his contribution was seminal to train so many people around the world, including many US centers. I think he was the father of core valve here in Latin America. So I'm glad that he's here and then I can say some few words about his contribution. You can see that the, the valve also had a, a, an incredible evolution and uh, this uh, latest generation, you see the change of the height of the valve. It's a nitinol self-expandable valve with a supra annular solution, as you can see here, the leaflets are not annular, but they are supra annular, which really increases the, the performance of this valve in terms of a high dynamic performance. And again, uh, some important features. I think I have a short <laughs> here that uh, will show you that this valve is, has an, also an important uh, attribute. It's uh, not only self-expandable, as you can see, but it's retrievable. So if you place the valve in the wrong position, you, can, uh, you have a chance to make two mistakes, and then you can reposition the valve. So this is the expansion with the sheet-based system that uh, you retract. And, and then you can you start to a deployment. You see that the retraction of the sheet. And then if it's too deep, for instance, such as in this case, you can retrieve the valve. You see the knob going backwards. And then you reposition the valve. And then you can... Uh, make your choice in terms of uh, the best deployment. And then it anchors into the ascending aorta. So this is something that you, are, you might be familiar, but it's always nice to uh, see this video again to understand how we deploy this valve. Moving to the third um, prototype, you see the Portico valve, which was uh, recently published in the US. There was a pivotal trial performed in the US. It's going to certainly remind you uh, core valve with uh, some differences. Perhaps with this valve, you have more open cells and less metal. I think there are some advantages and some disadvantages of doing that. It probably conforms a little bit uh, better in terms of uh, non-circular anatomy. But I think that uh, PVL might be, still be uh, a limitation of this, uh, of this particular valve. So again, another illustration so you understand the mechanism of deployment is very similar to what you just saw with core valve. And again, it's a sheet-based system that you retract, you pull back, and then you uh, deploy the ventricular side first, then the valve starts to work. You can retrieve if you need. So positioning here is not uh, such a big deal. Although we are all very obsessive to do it a little bit higher due to the pacemaker use. Uh, so not uh, many numbers, but I would like to share this recent publication by Raj Makar. This is a randomized trial with 750 patients that randomized 50% of these patients to Portico versus the most uh, popular uh, commercially available valves such as uh, SAIC and, and, and core valve. So the control arm are the FDA approved valves. And this slide will summarize alcohol's mortality and disabling stroke, which were very similar between these uh, two valves. So, th so that uh, shows the long-term efficacy. Now you see uh, some differences, probably due to the higher profile uh, feature of Portico, you see a little bit more vascular complication. So almost double vascular complication as compared to the commercially available 
uh, uh, valves, which are uh, 14 frames uh, uh, with the sheets that are available. And now you see also a little bit higher rates of paravalvular leak. Also, you generally you're going to agree with me that uh, self-expandable valves will have a little bit higher PVL as compared to uh, balloon expandable. Perhaps the exception will be the Lotus system, which is uh, has a big radio force, great radio force. But with this trial, when you see portico here, you see in blue a little bit more mild than in, in green, moderate uh, PVL as compared to core valve and, and uh, sapien, which is a little bit less PVL. So a little bit room for improvement with portico, but it's certainly going to be another option in your shelves uh, to treat patients with uh, aortic stenosis. So uh, moving to the LOTO system, again, great radio force, night and all, but you see this net with a little bit more metal. Uh, th there is this also outer skirt, this uh, uh, a power to avoid paravalvular leak. And again, good radio force. Uh, this is perhaps my, would be my choice number one for a bicuspid valve or very calcified valve. There is a little bit of a trade-off. It has a little bit more pacemaker use as compared to the other valves. But when you see uh, PVL, it's, it's really incredible that you have numbers in green here, which are very close to the ones that we see with the surgical valves. And in yellow, you see portico. In blue, you see uh, core valve evolute. And in pink, you see partner. So in terms of PVL, it compares very favorably with other competitors. So uh, Accurate Neo, again, uh, first team man performed here in Sao Paulo together with uh, my friend Eberhard in German and, and uh, Held Newman and, and Thomas Walter in Bannerheim. So this was a original contribution from Germany and Latin America. And uh, Zin Latib has a great deal of, the, of experience when he was uh, in Italy very soon to be approved in the US. The big pivotal trial is close to termination. So this is the close-up look of uh, accurate. It's also a nitinol based system with supra annular insertion of the porcine pericardium. It has this lower crown, this upper crown, and this stabilization arches. It's important to understand these three pieces of this valve so you understand the deployment. The illustration is here. After the alignment, you deploy, you, there is a sheet here that you move backwards and then you, you deploy the upper crown. So at this point, you can adjust the system to the best position. The second step is to deploy the stabilization arches. By doing that, you centralize the system, you, you make it very coaxial. So uh, it's very predictable, the deployment, when you are ready for the third and last step, which is to release the lower crown. So there is this sheet that goes forward into the ventricle, two or three millimeters, and releases the lower crown that the valve is functioning. So again, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, this device since uh, I've been exposed to, to the first demand uh, eight years ago. So this is an example from our series. You see the deployment of the upper crown. And at this point, you can really adjust you're going to find some difficulty going into the ventricle. It's very rare that it's going to embolize into the ventricle because of this cone shape. Then the second uh, step is to release the arches, and then it really stabilizes the whole system so we can go ahead with the very last step, which is to move this sheet forward and release the lower crown. You see the rate opaque markers here. And then uh, this is the final deployment with, uh, in this case, good angiographic result. Uh, there is not too much opening force, so we recommend pre-dilatation in most of our cases, but uh, PVL is not dramatically increased when you do good pre-dilatation. Pre uh, one slide to summarize the 1,000 patient registry that was performed in Europe. These are the 30-day uh, and 12-month uh, results. You see in green 30 day and uh, 12 months in blue. Uh, what really called my attention is the single digit of pacemaker use consistently throughout all series that tested accurate. So I think when you think about um, rhythm uh, conduction problems, you I think this is a good valve to choose. PVL, not perfect, three to 4% moderate, but any other 
um, complications or very low with uh, this new valve. Again, this was Accurate New. Now we are deal dealing with Accurate New 2, which is the latest version. You're going to see a picture of that. We were uh, somehow disappointed with the results of Scope 1 which showed 24% uh, event rates for accurate versus 17% with Sapien. This was a randomized trial that compared accurate versus Sapien. I think that there are some uh, plausible explanations for these differences. First, there was a learning curve for accurate, which was not the case for Sapien, with several centers very well experienced. I think that impacted a little bit in more uh, power valve la leap since the choice of the valve was a little bit underestimated we learned that with accurate we have to overestimate a little bit the size and, and then by doing that you're going to see less pvl also uh, a little bit more um raising creatinine since with this valve we had to test a little use a little bit more contrast but i think with the learning curve there will be not a dramatic difference between those two valves in fact the hemodynamics for accurate is superior uh, to Sapien in terms of uh, valve area and gradient. And this is the data that we published this week in catheterization cardiovascular intervention with my friend Dimitri Siqueira from uh, Dante. We, we really followed very carefully multiple times by echocardiography every six months to the five year period from the first 100 patients that we treated here in Sao Paulo. And it's very impressive to see that there is a consistent, sustained, um, low gradient and, and, and large area um, when you measure the annulus here. So I think that's good news for durability as we're gonna use these valves and treat more and more younger patients. And this is the survivor curve, despite the elderly age of 83 years old, you see that 60% of the patients were still alive at the end of five years. Again, uh, for the U.S. Uh, physicians, uh, you're going to start with the Accurate New 2. I think it was recently approved in Europe, but that's the device that has been tested in the U.S. for this multicenter pivotal trial for FDA approval. You can clearly see some differences here. I think the main one is the, the fact that they extended the skirt, uh, the, the, the peri uh, skirt here to try to avoid paravalvular leak. And now they increase the rate opaque marker, which is situated at this point, to help the physicians to precisely deploy this valve. The rate opaque marker was not so clear with the first generation valve, but now you can be a little bit more precise with deployment. Uh, Gina valve, I think that only perhaps two or three slides to summarize. Uh, I don't know what is the clinical status of this valve now. I heard they are a little bit on pause. But this to me would be the perfect uh, indication for aortic insufficiency. Since the mechanism of deployment is, is, is grabbing the leaflet and then it makes the leaflet like a sandwich for, for less calcified annulus and for aortic insufficiency, to me, this would be my preferred um, option. Allegra was uh, another valve that we tested here. We performed the first demand here in Sao Paulo. It's another self-expandable valve. It's interesting, has a different mechanism of deployment. Uh, first, you release the middle of the, the prosthesis, and then you do the final release of the distal and proximal edges. So that theoretically will uh, have a little bit more predictable deployment. So this is a, a angiographic example here is the, the release of the, the meat because it's self-expandable. Generally, you start from here or from proximal. And here you start in the middle and then you'll do the final release. Uh, I think now biosensors acquired Allegra. My valve is, uh, as, as you can clearly see, uh, a, a balloon expandable valve that reminds you uh, this Sapien device, but it's a, I would say a generic version of uh, Sapien uh, developed by a company called Mary Life Science in India. I, it was approved in India two years ago. I think it has a recent uh, C mark approval. And again, some uh, few differences, but essentially it's the same concept that you are very familiar with uh, the Sapien 3 device. They developed uh, also an expandable sheet called Python and that really helps with the, with the 
more challenge femoral approaches. This is an example from our friends uh, that was performed this valve in, in, uh, in India. The first in was performed by Samin Sharma from Mount Sinai. He, he has a hospital in India and performed the first man. So this is again a balloon expandable valve. And as you will appreciate in the next animation, a very good angiographic result with a good deployment. And again, this uh, might be uh, another option in the future for perhaps less privileged uh, geographic situations. Finally, uh, moving to my uh, last prototype, I'm not gonna talk about a typical uh, valve, a typical um, tower system, but uh, in, some, in some situations when you wanna see perhaps uh, when you wanna treat younger patients that you don't wanna put uh, permanent deployment. I think that Picardia developed an interesting solution. It also, Eberhard is very involved with this prototype. It's called Liflex. Um, the first demand is already going on in Europe. We're gonna start in Brazil in two months. So uh, an, another animation so you can see it's a, it's a valvotomy solution. It's not a permanent uh, deployment. You see the animation and you understand the mechanism of action of the Liflex system. Uh, it, it, com it includes uh, two components. Uh, the first one is this expander that you first deployment, you expose by retracting the sheet. Then uh, you expose the frame. You're gonna see how it performs this uh, decalcification, I would say, or, or cutting the calcium and expanding the leaflet with, which is uh, generally fibrotic with a lot of adherence. So you see that you have a, a, like a pigtail sheet at the end, so you can follow the gradient because that's a parameter you use to see if you did a good job or not. So you follow the gradient, then you're gonna see how it performs. So the expander, the expander will be you know, inflated and now you, yeah, that's the mechanism. So you can do that multiple times because you can orient the frame in different directions as long as it's within the leaflet. And you see the scoring of calcium, which really helps uh, to have a more permanent uh, result as compared to the plain old balloon valvoplasty. Because you know that in generally six months, one year, there's a lot of restenosis. With this device, we might see you know, a less invasive solution, instead of having a permanent device, you can um, again perform this uh, scoring and open the, the valve in a way that it could at least postpone a more permanent deployment in the future. So as you can see, several solutions. I would finish my presentation with uh, some thoughts for you to think about. I think that uh, major improvements have been made on the tower technology during this past decade. So credit to many smart engineers, many brave physicians such as Eberhard and yourself, Azim, that tested all these valves um, and, and, and looking for uh, the best solution. I think that we, we can certainly, with this armamentario, uh, choose uh, our devices in, in, in lower risk situation. And again, I still believe that there is no perfect system that addresses every single limitations such as vascular complication, PVL, pacemaker use. We might have to think about customization in the future. So it's good to have three, four systems in your shell so you can make your selection when according to the anatomy, according to the clinical status of the patient. And, and something that I really believe that with the proper training, with good training and good heart team to make the right decisions is a, the key for success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> that was great. That was a great overview of all the systems. I think, you know, just to, to see them one after the other, I think particularly for the fellows is very important and it gives them really an idea um, of what the different mechanisms are. So while we're waiting for the questions to, to come and Ahmed will, will will do the questions. I wanted to ask a question to you and Eberhard. Now, we, we've had now a few randomized studies comparing a new valve to an established valve, 
okay? Or even comparing to established valves. And when I look at the data from all those studies, um, often what I see is that the data from the randomized study doesn't reflect real world experience, especially for the new valve, right? Yet, it, though it does seem to, you know, it is the best science we have uh, doing randomized controlled trials. I mean, what do you think the future is for different, the, all these different technologies? We continue doing these randomized studies. I mean, is, does it make sense? You know, uh, should we just do single arm studies? I wanted to hear both, from both of you what your thoughts were. Let's start with Ebahar so I can have a, a little coffee and then I compliment. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, um, Azim, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, obviously Alex is the main person and I'm always happy to join him. Uh, you know, he's my brother. Uh, I should say my soul brother. You know, I'm a more sinner. He's a, he's a good man and I'm the sinner, as you well know. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about talking about the tablet devices, uh, uh, Alex. Congratulations! A beautiful summary and a beautiful wrap up. Obviously, many things come into my mind. Uh, I'm sure um, the question that Azim is addressing, uh, it's all of us addressing. Uh, how many how many future studies we need uh, in order to uh, to get some kind of saturation in the market? And I think <clears throat> these questions are very relevant. Uh, given the fact that this is a very, very mature field, the bars are very high, whether really, you know, randomized trials are necessary. Well, they are necessary, as you said, but I'm not sure, um, you know, whether, you know, these these valves, you know, enter the, the, the main markets, at least. I mean, there are local, the local preferences, like my valve, an, an excellent valve. Uh, you know, as soon as these valves come up, um, you know, the legal battle starts now with Edwards and my valve. Before that was, was, was core valve. Physicians are not really uh, looking into this. They're looking for performance, eventually now more than ever for prices. And that's an important issue. I think the question that Azim raised is a very important one. You know, as with all randomized trials, randomized trials are necessary. They are the basis for any future um, study, for any future, yeah, development studies. Uh, they do not represent the real world. That's why we have well-conducted registries. And I do agree, every randomized trial, at least for the most part, uh, they have a selection bias. They have uh, many other things that you simply don't see in the real world situation. So um, I don't think that we will, that we will continue to seeing those whether you know these 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 new devices will enter the market remains to be seen it's very hard because physicians today look at the data and then uh, they decide on the other hand because the field is so mature um it's very very difficult to change things and um if i might add another question and you can ask this you can answer that later the dual valve strategy from Boston Scientific, you know, Lotus versus uh, Cementus, we should briefly, I would be interested in your opinion about that too, obviously. Alex, so, yeah. yeah, so not much perhaps to complement based on, on Eberhard's comments. I think that uh, sometimes these randomized trials are not very fair because it compares generally a, a more mature valve with a lot of clinical experience and training with a new system that we are still learning. Um, I think we, we might in the future do what FDA is accepting to do a, perhaps a historical control. It's always nicer to have a head-to-head -head comparison, no, no doubt about that. But uh, uh, more recently, they're accepting um, a, a registry, a one arm as compared to historical data, which I think it, it might be okay as there is a little bit of a learning phase. Um, also, the, random, the randomization is not so fair when we think about the current use of Tower. Uh, I think five years ago, I would say that in 80% of my cases, I would use any valve, perhaps a core valve versus a Sapien, as, as we had available in our shelves. Now, with there are so many nuances and we learned so much that perhaps in 70 to 80% of my cases, I would customize. I would prefer one versus the other. 
there are so many uh, uh, players there. I think that in terms of, for instance, when you see a lot of calcification in the outflow tract, you might be a little bit afraid of uh, using a, a balloon expandable valve. So I would go for more uh, 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 self-expandable valve. I think that by cuspid valve, I want to some, have something that has more radial force. Um, with small annulus, I want to perhaps a super annulus solution. So there's, there are so many nuances that you don't see that in randomized trials, I think. So I, I probably would think for the word, the real world use as compared to, you know, put every, everybody in the same uh, package. Right. So, Azim, if I may ask a question, I mean, you know, you're very kind to us, but in reality, you know, you know as much as we do about all these valves. You know, I, I was at a very difficult call um, the other day. You're looking at, at all these valves. It's very hard for, for new industries to establish and to position their valves in an established mature market. Probably, you know, the, the randomized trial, the results of randomized trials, as, as Alex said, you know, they're always a little bit biased and they're not fair. Uh, but at the end of the day, they try to enter the market by pricing. But that doesn't always work well. I mean, you know the numbers. You know the numbers very well. The market leader, and that's no secret, the market leader is S3 followed by Sapien, I mean, followed by Evolute. And then the Portugal. Portugal was always a less expensive valve, as you know. But still, um, when we look at the Boston Scientific situation, there was a reason why they have acquired Symantis uh, at that point or actually um, because they had to take Lotus back in, on, on the bench. Mm -hmm. And now, after two, three years, they came back, and now they have a very expensive valve, a technical valve, a valve, despite the fact that the, the data are excellent, the pacemaker issue remains to be proven, but it's still a valve that you have to remi remember certain steps um, uh, and versus a, a fairly straightforward uh, actuate two and, and, and three. Do you think this is valid for a company to uh, to move forward with the dual valve approach? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, you know, particularly as we've seen how Edwards has pulled out of the dual valve approach, right? Exactly. You know, Centera. they had Centera as well, uh, which I thought was a very interesting valve because we've never seen a self-expandable valve that is so short uh, and, you know, with so much functionality, with the automated control and so on. So, you know, I've thought long and hard about this. Um, I, I do think for, for Boston, if they, they position themselves well, there is a story for them to have two valves. Because I do think the Lotus covers a specific anatomies where I'm prepared to say, I'm prepared to accept double digit pacemaker rates. I'm, I'm prepared to accept a 15, 16%, even 18% pacemaker rate if I can get zero PVL in a very complex anatomy, right? And I, so I think for them, it makes sense. I mean, I, I don't know if it makes sense from a commercial point of view, because obviously making these valves, uh, unless you're making large quantities and selling large quantities, it does become, it makes the price remain expensive. Um, but for me, you know, I, I used a lot of accurate, uh, we've published about it, we're in the IDE study here in New York. Um, I think it's a great everyday valve, sort of workhorse valve that you can use in many anatomies um, with, with single digit pacemaker rates. So I don't think that valves are gonna go away. I think they need to continue, you know, using that be their predominant mm -hmm. valve. And I think the Lotus is uh, gonna, for me, is gonna be a niche valve for now. Um, severe alveot calcification, bicuspid valves, severe calcification, maybe even uh, some cases of aortic regurgitation, it may be interesting um, if you can oversize sufficiently. What do you think, yeah. Alec? A hundred, I agree 100%. I think I also learned from Eberhard that uh, regarding girlfriends, two is better than one. So I think that having two <laughs> options is not a bad idea. I think that uh, you, the example that you quoted with, uh, with Edwards, I think it's because I think Centira didn't work so well. Otherwise, I think they would cap both. Um, but I agree with you that Accred will be perhaps a less complex to manufacture, less costly, and it will be a workhorse. And when we talk about you know, more calcified, um, and, and by cuspid valve, I would uh, choose Lotus. So this dual approach is not bad since there is little overlap between the two. 
I think that we can really make our choices and customize it based on, on the anatomy and, and uh, eventually some of the clinical drivers. Ahmed, there were quite a few questions from the participants. Maybe you want to go through that, and then I have a couple of more questions for Dr. Abizet. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lafib. Thank you, Dr. Abizet, for this great summary. Uh, you know, as I was listening to uh, your lecture, I really felt how fortunate and privileged we are. We live in an era where over less than two decades, we actually went all the way from you know inventing this uh, new technology to actually perfecting it now you went over uh, seven different uh, innovative valves some of them will be actually available soon and as physicians you know we we will have multiple options actually to pick and choose and a lot of the questions including my questions focus on this specific point that we're really moving from choosing a valve to more like customization and individual approach based on multiple factors that fit every single patient and every patient is different. So it's, it's more a tailored approach. Um, a lot of questions here is, is about those specific points. Uh, during discussion, we covered some of them, including, for example, the niche um, uh, use of the lotus uh, valve in calcified anatomy, probably bicuspid uh, valve as well. Can you really quickly go over a summary that, you know, once those new valves are available, what would be your kind of algorithm or approach to pick and choose based on specific variables? Yeah, I, I think that's the one million dollar question. I think that's what it comes with the experience and it's going to be a little bit uh, individual. First of all, in terms of training, if you are not a super high volume center, it's going to be impossible that you're going to be fully well trained in five, six different systems. You're going to be you're going to have to choose between, you know, two or three. So I would always go with a, a balloon expandable. So you perhaps uh, S3 will be one option that you should have in your, in your shelf. And then you can choose uh, perhaps one or two self-expendable valves. So regarding when you are super high volume, then you can experience more. But in a, in a low volume center, I would focus in two or three systems, first of all. Then I try to follow some kind of algorithm, which is a little bit empiric. But when I have a, a, a very tough, anatomy in terms of uh, small femorals, and then I still want to keep my femoral approach. Uh, the, perhaps the valve that I think first is Evolute R. I think it's a true 14 French and very friendly with access, has a little bit, it's a little bit less traumatic. So I, I have to consider that. When I think about a patient that has a, a, perhaps a a left bundle block or, or a right bundle block or, or, or any kind of disturbance in terms of the rhythm, I would go for a, a, a valve that uh, has less chance of pacemaker. So accurate is certainly one of my first choices. And again, this is something that I concern because it increases cost, hospital stay, and has late impact. So I don't wanna see my patients with high rates of pacemaker. When I think about a, a big annulus with a lot of calcium, accurate is not my first choice for sure. So I would go for, uh, it depends on the size of the annulus, I would go for Evolu 34. Or if I, I can accommodate uh, a, a Lotus or, or a big uh, S3, I would go for that. So it, it, we, I generally try to follow, you know, access, pacemaker, chance of PVL. Uh, a lot of calcium in the outflow. So try to really with your CT and echo person to sit down for a few minutes and try to map the, the, the risk of these patients with multiple valve and try to customize. I'm doing this more and more as opposed to just pick the first one that I have in my shelf. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Can I just say something? One, one, quick, one quick remark. You know, there are subjective and objective criteria for a physician to select a valve. Uh, it depends on certain, uh, certain um, things that, that Alex described, which might be superior from one valve to the other. So there are objective criteria 
that would fit one up or the other, but they are also subjective experience, relationship with companies, prices, all of these things um, um, go in. You know, whether you choose uh, one or the other, I think basically you cannot, as a company, you cannot survive with a niche product. Uh, regarding uh, Azim's, Azim's um, comment on, on, on Lotus, for example. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you get along with two, three valves that you have experience on. Um, and then, you know, basically we know we can cover all our patients with, with three valves, with different, obviously with different, um, um, you know, possibilities to, to, to cover certain anatomic criteria. Thank you. There are a few other questions about uh, a specific um, uh, of each valve. Uh, there's a question about the accurate NEO. Is it a retrievable and a repositionable valve? It is repositionable, but not retrievable. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when you release the upper crown, you are free to go forward and backwards. When you release the arches, I would not recommend you to pull back too much because you can dissect the ascending order, but, but it, it, the refinement in terms of adjustment to go a little bit forward is, is totally allowed. And, and again, I, 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 ha I have to say that I don't know what Azim has to say, but this valve has been very predictable after you go through the learning curve in terms of uh, deployment, in terms of uh, positioning. So in, in this so, valve, yeah. positioning is uh, should be like forward towards the LV once you open the upper crown rather than exactly. pull. So you exactly. tend to kind of like start implantation at a higher level and then reposition it inside like forward motion. Yeah, no, you, you try to start your first step with the right place. No, not not to start the deployment and then I'm going to do just the adjustment. No, try to. And in my experience, I go a little bit lower. Because I think that the format, the shape, you know, it grabs the leaflet downwards. Yeah. So I, I like a little bit lower, but it, again, it comes with the experience. But it, it's perhaps the more one of the more predictable valves that I ever tested in terms of position. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's very predictable, Ahmed. You know, you tend to it tends to land where you want it to land most times. Uh, you don't have to use spacing to implant it. Uh, you know, it's a slow implantation, the patient remains stable, so there are definitely advantages to it. So, so there is an interesting question here about uh, my first choice for Taver valve. In a young patient with bicuspid valve, we mixed AS and AI. I would like to, to hear your opinion, but I probably would go for Sapien 3. I think that uh, having coronary access is very important. It has a good rate of force for my cuspid. So um, my choice would be probably uh, between Sapien 3 and Lotus. I, I want to hear your opinion, Ebarhan and Azim. <laughs> Why don't you know? I, I mean, I have my opinion. That, that's different from yours. But um, Azim, why don't you do that first? Well, so, you know. This, uh, the question is by our, you know, our head of echocardiography, so I think it's a very pertinent question, um, Cynthia. I have to admit that uh, certainly in a young patient, I at this stage uh, still think surgery is the first line of therapy for bicuspids, um, with or without aortopathy. Um, just because I think one of my concerns with treating young patients uh, particularly by Casper young patients, is that we know from CT data that these valves are not circular when we implant them. They, they off-center, they squash, they're oval-shaped, and we really don't know what the long-term durability of these uh, are. So, you know, right now, I will, if it's a high-risk uh, by Casper, I'm happy to do that. I agree with Alex. I think you can use uh, Sapien. I think you can use... Um, Lotus. I also think you can use core valve. I think, you know, I've had good experience with all three valves. It's just a question of your own experience. Um, when you start getting to younger patients, I think we do need more data. And I think with younger patients, the, the, um, the data about durability is important. We have seen from some of these registries also a slightly higher incidence of stroke, uh, periprocedural stroke related with preaching bicuspids. So, you know, I tend to now 
um, protect these patients' brains more routinely uh, with Sentinel. Um, but I am still, when it comes to young bicuspids, we have a long, hard team discussion in our center and really figure out what's the best uh, approach for that patient. Eberhard, what do you do? I totally agree with you. Um, you know, um, I, I think bicuspid is a special topic. Uh, and if we talk about younger patients, let's be honest. I mean, what, what exactly means younger patients? You mean patients with more occurrence of bicuspid valves. And I think we need more information. We do know, uh, just recently published you know, at ACC, you know, there are excellent results for all the valves, actually for other valves and bicuspid situations, but we don't know much about the long-term results. So I would agree with you. We need, you know, a little bit more. And if you discuss this with a heart team, let's be honest, surgery is still a good option. Um, you know, a low risk patient with, uh, you take the, the valve out and, and then put a, a very decent surgical valve in and the surgeons operate a little bit more differently with a little bit more concern and opening areas and things like that, PPM. So all this comes into the play. I think the, the, the heart team discussion here is very important. I wouldn't force yet uh, Taver and young patients uh, knowing, you know, that, you know, complications, long-term results are a little bit different from what we have been talking about in the past. Uh, there is a question here, uh, Azim, from my former fellow uh, called Dimitri Zappi, that yeah. he, he, wants, he wants to challenge me and Eberhard about a 10 French device. When do you think we're going to have available to do it uh, transradial, Eberhard? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we are not there yet. Uh, Eberhard and I tested a device that we assemble in the aorta, which would be 12 French. I think that there's a lot to learn about that. I think that eventually there'll be smart engineers that will come up with good solutions. But uh, so far, be happy with 14. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, there, there, there are always some interesting options, but the field is so mature um, with excellent results. I think the French size um, have been in the past have been an important issue. It is much less of an issue in today's world with, uh, with 16, 14 French than we were thinking many years ago when we had these big devices. I think that's not a major issue anymore. So I think there's also an interesting question about um, um, prep, you know, you, you mentioned um, Leaflex, the Leaflex technology, right? There's also, you know, some of us have also worked with Shockwave on their technology. There's, you know, a couple of companies that are looking at these technologies of treating the valve uh, without putting a prosthetic valve in, either as a standalone therapy or as an adjunct in complex anatomy. I mean, wh where do you think the role of this is going to be five years from now? Well, uh, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, I don't think this is going to be perhaps my uh, our first choice is in every single patient. Uh, but if it works as, as a long-term bridge, I'm, I'm going to be happy. I think for younger patients with uh, you know a good amount of calcium, I think it certainly might be a good option to postpone the permanent implantation. We don't know yet, as in after more than 10 years, what, what is the, the, the numbers we have for 10 year, 15 year follow-up with Tauber, right? Yeah. So yeah. If, you, if in a young patient, a 65 year old patient, if I can do a device like that to uh, postpone my Tauber system in five years or six, seven years, I would be very happy because then you have a chance to use a valve and then perhaps a valve evolve and this patient will never be operated. So I, I, I would consider that certainly, and I don't have the results yet. We, this is in the first team and phase. Ebahar and I are gonna do in Brazil, hopefully in two or three months when the airplanes open, <laughs> when the <laughs> situation gets better. But uh, I would be first looking forward to understand what are the bailout uh, rates for instance, when you do a device like that, how many AR you're going to have to live with, and you might have to cross over to a permanent implantation. And most importantly, the duration of that. I think it's going to be certainly much better than balloon, but we don't know yet. But uh, I think it's a technology that I would pay attention in the next few years. Right. 
So, so I was I was hoping you would ask that question because uh, you know I, I give you my opinion, but I would also be very interested in in your perspective, Fazim. I'm looking at this both. You know, I've done uh, shock. I've first of all, I've done picardia many many years ago. Picardia has been around for some time because you know development phase, and I've done cases in Paraguay with shockwave. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, um, topic, I think. And I th you know, looking at where and how would you use a scoring device, um, I think there are potentially um, some some things that we can discuss. Number one, um, you can discuss it as a bridge option, um, regardless on how you define bridging. But you know, there are many there are many countries where you know you don't necessarily have to you know put a tablet device in um, and wait until either the patients are getting older or the patients are getting into a less risk status so a bridge as a bridging device number one you can because we know calcium is a risk factor for many things including stroke pvls pacemakers ruptures and all of that so maybe you can overcome that with this device knowing that any addition to cost might be a problem. But then also look at um, the situation where my friend is coming from, Brazil, or look at India, look at uh, countries with a high population and an underserved population. What are you doing with those patients today? They will not get a valve. They will either die, have a medical, uh, have a medical management, or you try the balloon. And we know the balloon isn't working very well. So there are options um, for these devices um, for both the TAVA world and the non-TAVA world. And I'm really optimistic that once it's established, um, you know, it shifts a little bit. We are so used and so focused on TAVA today that it is hard for us to imagine any technology that would go sideways and say, well, maybe, but, we also know if something less complex, less complicated, less expensive is effective, we're opening our eyes and uh, our hearts to that uh, to that particular um, treatment option. Yeah, so yes, maybe where I disagree with both of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not as positive for these technologies. Um, you know, I think we all have our opinion, um, but I'll tell you why my opinion is like that. Um, I think, you know, Tava has just become so reproducible and it resolves the issue so well. I agree with you, we don't have long-term data uh, on a durability of this valve, but it's going to be even harder to get long-term durability data on these devices you talk about. So I struggle to see in my own practice, you know, where I'm going to use this device as a standalone device, particularly because both, you know, the ones we talked about, Leaflex and Shockwave, require anything between 16 and 18 French sheaths though right? They're still devices where I take the risk of vascular access, I take the risk of stroke, um, maybe even more so. Um, and the fact that in certain countries, we have to, we may be able to use this because we can't give patients valves, I struggle a little bit with. And, you know, I think we should be coming up, coming up with valves that are cheaper for those countries or charge, you know, less for those valves in those countries. So we give those patients opportunities. But anyway, uh, we'll, well, we'll no, that's, course, I mean, that's, that's an important aspect. I, I do agree. Although, you know, he comes into the game, Azim, what, what Alex mentioned before. Here you have a device which is a first demand device and you're competing against a third, fourth, fourth generation tablet devices. Yeah. So as far as, as far as vascular complications are concerned, stroke, uh, valuable right now, but um, I think that will come down. But anyway, this is obviously a very interesting topic. We'll see. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Cynthia Tab has another question. I think it's relevant just from what we were talking about. Um, and I'm going to read it uh, verbatim. So she said, you know, money in medicine is often perceived as a dirty word. In addition to technical considerations, do you think, and that's us, the three of us, uh, about short and long term financial consequences? How do you approach cost and benefit analysis in, in Tava? Well, for, first of all, I think just by the fact that now the third and the fourth and the fifth system is getting to the U.S., 
and it's already uh, you know, reached uh, Europe and many other countries. I think the competition by itself, this, is the, this was the discussion that we had in the early days of DES, remember that, it was extremely expensive, we only had Cypher, but as, as we move forward and then we see more competition and more technologies and perhaps generic solutions, I think this is gonna be minimized, uh, not of course uh, trivial, but uh, minimized. Uh, and, and again, there, there are smart people doing cost-effective analysis with you know, quality of life. And, and I'm more and more convinced that a less invasive procedure, even if it's a little bit more costly to start with, will dilute uh, over the, the years afterwards. Absolutely. <laughs> Cynthia, you know, I would also say if you look at um, all the randomized studies that have been published, there are, for, for most of the randomized studies, cost-benefit analyses that have been done by, uh, if you look on PubMed, David Cohen is probably the person oh. to look at the most. And, and they show exactly that. There's a higher initial cost that we pay for Tava because of the technology. But if you look then at one year and look at quality adjusted life years, you know, people going back to the activities, not requiring rehab, um, and as we get to younger patients, maybe even going back to work, it seems to be the, the cost benefit analysis seems to favor Tava actually um, in, in many of these studies. There certainly doesn't seem to be an added cost. I do think, you know, one of the challenges we face in the US is that we pay more than double uh, the price of these valves than compared to, to Europe. Um, you know, in Europe, uh, we were paying as you know as little as ten thousand euro for a valve, um, and yeah, the valves are all priced at thirty two thousand um, dollars. Having said that, I don't I don't think we should be also going into these price wars. Uh, I like the fact that in the U.S. the valves will cost the same price. So for me as a as a doctor, I'm not being told told by my administration I have to choose one valve or the other. I can choose what I think is best for the patient, best and for the anatomy. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. what's happened in Europe in many institutions, even where I've worked previously, is administration gets involved in our decisions as doctors and tries to tell us what valves to implant because certain valves are cheaper. Um, Ahmed, maybe last two questions and we'll let uh, Alex and Abaha go. Okay. Uh, a question from my co-fellow, Oi. He's asking about your experience on any... Uh, data on valve thrombosis on these newer uh, valves. Is there any preliminary or even anecdotal data in terms of uh, leaflet thrombosis? Yeah, the short answer is no. I don't think that there is any comparison between any, you know, between valves, which one would have a little bit more thrombosis than the other. There is an indirect comparison in terms of hemodynamic performance but nothing in terms of, um, first of all, there is a, a big debate how we define stent, uh, valve thrombosis. There's a lot of definitions out there. And then uh, something that uh, we learned from our friend surgeons, when they define, for instance, valve dysfunctions are the, are the patients that really were very symptomatic and had a, a valve replacement. Other than that, nobody really looked very careful on CT scan, on echocardiography. So I think first we are learning how to define uh, uh, prosthesis thrombosis, uh, but the short answer is there is nothing that uh, we compare head to head between the valves, among the valves. Right, as in the, the, any new data that I'm not aware? Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty Maybe the if you, look, if you look at all the different studies, uh, and they're all retrospective studies, most of them, uh, that have more than one valve, and so there's lots of bias. There's, there is a slight signal, maybe, that superannular technologies have slightly less uh, yeah. thrombosis. Yeah, that's uh, what I said, because different. of the hemodynamics, yeah. Because of the hemodynamics and the washout of the leaflets and so on. So yeah. it's, there seems to be a slight signal that maybe intraannular could have a slightly higher, but we're not talking about five times higher. We're talking about, you know, very small numbers. Okay. Uh, I think we have one or a couple of more minutes for one last question. And it's actually a question that I was thinking about when you talked about the Jena valve and with the unique uh, deployment, you mentioned that you can also use it when there is aortic insufficiency. 
Davar now is the standard for uh, aortic uh, valve stenosis, severe aortic valve stenosis. How far do you think we are from using uh, similar technology for aortic insufficiency? Yeah, I think that's a great question because we're going to see our patients. It's not rare that uh, every other month there is a, a cardiologist that comes to me with, uh, uh, do you have a, a less invasive solution for aortic insufficiency? We are, we, we are treating those patients right now, but with some with a couple of parameters. First of all, when I see a aortic sufficiency that has some calcification, that uh, the amulus is not so large, or the ascending aorta is not so large, which is rare because of the insufficiency, generally you see big aortas. I, I, I still, you know, the, the, the 34 French uh, Evolute Pro is a good option. And, and sometimes when you have good calcium that you can anchor a balloon expandable while you choose. But um, again, other than, um, than Gina valve, I haven't seen any you know, perfect uh, solution and indication for AR, a, a customized valve for that specific indication. I'm not sure if Ebahar or Azim are aware of any other system. Yeah, no, the only yeah. other one is the Chinese uh, version, the J-valve, which is very similar. It also grasps onto the leaflets. You know, I think the Yenna, I'm, I'm interested to see more in Yenna. I really do hope that this company survives uh, mm. and is able to be out there. Um, I think besides the aortic regurgitation part, I also think the, the commissional alignment part and maybe the ability to use it in low coronaries, right? Because the fact, Ahmed, uh, that you're grabbing the leaflets means you're not pushing them outwards. You're actually pulling them towards the, towards the valve. And so, you know, there's some good data for patients with low coronaries that the risk of coronary obstruction is actually significantly lower. And I'm also, you know, wondering about this whole issue of commissural alignment, you know, that we align the commissures to the original valve, which maybe then will make it easier, may help durability, but will make it easier when we have to do Tava and Tava, right? Um, there was one last question from Antonio uh, Mangieri about is anybody planning a balloon expandable valve with a superannular design? <laughs> you know? Not as far as I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the, the, problem, the problem with that is, Azim, that okay. has something to do with the physics and the dynamics. There was, I mean, the, the you know, the, the balloon expandable valves traditionally, if, if you look at, if you look at um, my valve and uh, Sapien, uh, together with Lotus, mechanically expandable. All these valves are very flat valves, and they, you know, the the, the stress strain situation in these small valves is a lot different from the self-expanding valves, which are usually larger valves, which a completely different stress strain relationship uh, of the leaflets, as we all know, um, bovine comparing bovine with uh, or pericardium bovine and 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 pigs porcine. Um, I don't think, first of all, there is any. Um, I know that, you know, you, when, when you try to do a self-expanding uh, self short valve, like the Centera, for example, um, then you have to look into the, the, the thickness of the material of the leaflets because you have to have most probably uh, thicker leaflets for the stress strain situation. And, um, you know, what, what the companies are trying to do now to shorten the valve as much as they can, but not sacrificing the super um, um, advantage, potential advantages uh, and giving them the advantage of using porcine, um, a porcine material for the, for the thickness of the, uh, of the size of the delivery catheters. So there are a lot of compromises, but mainly it is because of physics um, where, where there are limitations. So I, I'm not aware of anything that's being developed there. I know they're developing a self-expanding shorter valve, um, you know, but try not to, not to um, sacrifice the advantages of, of superannuality. Yeah, absolutely. Eberhard, uh, thank you so much. Alex, that was a phenomenal talk again. Uh, I. I love you both and I miss you and I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> I love you too, I hope. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.